morning, everyone. So we're going to continue our final review in looking at the chapter on acids and bases. Uh, even before we recap some of the main definitions, starting off with the Arrhenius definition, we actually have a fellow named Lavoisier. Uh, in the 1700s, he described uh, acids as things that have uh, oxygen in it. So he defined it here, uh, acid or acidity uh, is the presence of having oxygen in the compound. This was typically called the universal acidifying principle. Essentially, he found compounds, specifically the non-metals we're looking at, say phosphorus and sulfur, when these guys here ended up reacting with oxygen, they ended up creating what we now know as covalent compounds. Because these ones here are non-metal oxides, as we would expect from chapter three, non-metal oxides will react with water and eventually then form, in this case here, it would form H3PO4, and this one here would form sulfuric acid. He eventually sort of based on this, well, these elements here, because they have oxygen, they somehow end up creating what are nowadays called acids. So therefore, he said things that contain oxygen are acids. Uh, we've come a long way from that definition there. Uh, we start off mainly uh, introducing the Arrhenius definition. Uh, this is the one that we learn uh, since grade 11 here. Acids are things that are supposed to be able to dissociate and release an H plus in water. And H plus is your typical acid particle. If you think about for the H atom here, uh, element number one and also molar mass of one, element number one says you have one proton, but strangely enough, the most stable form of hydrogen, the most uh, common isotope, actually has zero neutrons. So for hydrogen as an atom, we so far have one proton in the core, we're supposed to have one counterbalancing electron as an H atom. When I then become an H+, plus, this guy here has been oxidized, I've completely lost this electron. Upon losing that electron, we notice that there's a vast difference in size. Our radius here for the H atom used to be the size of the first shell, and now suddenly upon losing that first shell, now I'm only the size of a proton. So we can see that an H plus is actually a proton. H pluses, uh, because they're charged, also they're a very, very dense positive charge as well. Uh, they can't exist by themselves. Uh, fortunately for us here, we only need to be able to release this H plus when we're in the background, we can assume that the background is water. What we're gonna see here is water acts as a ligand, just like in chapter three. Uh, water is gonna donate its electrons here. It's gonna form that covalent bond. It's called a coordinate or a dative bond here. And we end up creating an H uh, bonded to the H2O here. Water overall is a neutral molecule, so it cannot completely get rid of the fact that H has a plus charge, but overall now we've created H3O plus, which we now refer to as a hydronium ion. So we saw throughout this chapter here, uh, you can see H plus is synonymous with a proton. In solution, H plus actually doesn't exist. H plus is actually an H3O plus. Back in chapter three, we said ligands, the most common geometry was coordination number six. In this case here, because the H is so tiny, uh, we can only have one water ligand around it. So there's an example of a polyatomic that's positive, just like ammonium, and H4 plus is positive. That is our Arrhenius definition for an acid. In a very similar fashion here for an Arrhenius base, we learned that OH minus is the example of uh, what basic solutions will have. Again, it's not just I have to hold an OH. Uh, usually I can say like, let's say BOH, where B can be anything. It has to be with dissociated water. Fortunately, compounds that have hydroxide, if it's like an alkali, salt, something like that, this will completely dissociate whatever the charge of the metal is, and it's gonna generate the hydroxide upon dissolving. I have the characteristic base particle, so therefore my BOH is now a base. In fact, things that have an OH like this category, we're gonna categorize later on as actually called a strong base. Uh, we're gonna find that weak bases will uh, utilize the other definitions. So, uh, so far that's Arrhenius uh, definitions there. We know acids and bases sort of do opposites. So we're gonna have an acid uh, and a base when they react together, they're gonna neutralize and they're gonna form a salt, which is a generic ionic compound. And they always form water because the acid donates the H part the base donates the OH minus part, and that part there always reacts in a one-to-one -one ratio to form HO, or HO is your water. If you have to guess, neutralizations are gonna be exothermic, so we would expect the heat term to be on the far side here. So we start off with that definition here. Uh, they introduce you some common acids. Uh, sulfuric acid is known as the king of chemicals. Basically, we produce many millions of tons of every year. Uh, it's used as a catalyst. We saw it in a lot of our organic reactions there. Hydrochloric is an example of our stomach acid as well. It's a very potent odor, especially when it's very strong. When we dilute things, always remember acid into a big vat of water. 
Acetic acid is a concentrated form of uh, like a vinegar material. Vinegar is, we did a lab, maybe about 3%, 4% uh, acetic acid. So those are some common acids here. Uh, in terms of some common bases, we use sodium hydroxide a lot, especially for our titrations. Uh, that's also used for drain cleaners. So in case there's like a, um, a wish base here, is very commonly used for drain cleaner. Uh, that's going to be the same uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, we also talk about ammonia. We then run into a sort of problem here because we're like, well, ammonia actually doesn't have an OH. How come this one here can actually be categorized as a base as well? We learn that we have to go from the Arrhenius definition now to the Bronsteloy definition. So the second definition here we're going to have is the Bronsteloy definition. For an acid, it hasn't changed by much. For an acid, we're still looking at H pluses. We're still looking at being able to give up the H plus when we're in water. The main change is a Bronsteloy base. Instead of focusing on it supposedly giving an hydroxide, we actually find that by stealing an H plus from something, by accepting the H plus like a, like a football, uh, it ends up generating uh, the hydroxide. So let's just see an example of that there with ammonia. So we have ammonia. When you put this here in water, we're going to use the Arrhenius definition. We're told that uh, ammonia here is a weak base. That's why we see that there's an equilibrium arrow here. If this is a base, I know that water is currently acting as an acid. Water is uh, called amphiprotic or amphoteric. Basically, it can have the capacity of acting as acid or base. In this case here, water currently has an H+. It's the proton donor. We're going to pass this proton here over to the ammonia, and ammonia is now going to pick up and become ammonium. It's actually water that's going to leave behind the hydroxide. So it's totally OK that ammonia by itself doesn't have hydroxide in its compound. In receiving that proton from water, it ends up generating the hydroxide instead anyways. Uh, we know as a weak acid, this ionization doesn't happen completely, so most of it actually stays on this side. In fact, so little actually ionizes over, we actually assume that that X was uh, minimal. So there's a slight change to the bronze lorry definition. In this case here, we start talking about them being conjugate pairs. Uh, conjugates are things that differ by a single proton. So there's that definition there. Conjugate pair differs by a single proton. The acid currently has the proton. So for example, NH4 plus is holding the football. So that one is the conjugate acid. Water is holding the football. That's the conjugate acid. The conjugate base would have lost the football. So before the ammonia picked up the football, uh, ammonia is the conjugate base. That's why it's the base in the equation. Or hydroxide was left behind here ends up becoming OH minus, which is uh, also without the uh, proton, without the football. So therefore, uh, it is the conjugate base. Notice that every time you have these conjugate uh, base conjugate acid reactions, we're always looking at a one proton transfer. So the balancing in this section will be super simple. We're always going to have a base and an acid, and an acid and a base on both sides, and the conjugate pairs are sort of on opposite sides. So ammonia is conjugate pair, and the water is conjugate pair here. This will eventually set up another competition. We have now ammonia fighting against water. Ammonia was the better base. This one here has the uh, stronger KB. By the time we end up generating another base, now there's another competition set up between our very own ammonia, but the new hydroxide that we end up forming as well. Uh, and we compare on the table here which one's a stronger base. Whichever one is the stronger one, in this case your hydroxide, uh, I believe it is stronger here, it should be able to kick the equilibrium over to the left-hand side. So therefore we can say reactants are favored, justifying why you have so much ammonia uh, at equilibrium. So that's the typical setup here. Make sure you can define conjugates and identify the different pairs. The side that actually has the weaker one is set to be favored because if the winning team is on the other side, they do their job better. They kick the volleyball over to the left-hand side here. The volleyball lands on this side of the court more often, so there's more of it at equilibrium. So in that case there, uh, just a quick recap of bronson uh, acid and base. Uh, we talked about the term here being amphiprotic or amphoteric, uh, like water. Uh, Careful when you're defining it, don't say it has to be a neutral molecule or a charged molecule. Sometimes it is charged, sometimes it is neutral. So I generally prefer here, just use the terminology species, just be a little bit generic and just be like, oh, it's a chemical that can behave as acid or base. Depending on what else it's mixing with, uh, it could be either uh, acid or base. Um, so it could be water or something that's polyprotic. Typically, it will have a negative charge. Uh, let's do H2S as an example. I wouldn't expect this guy here to be basic because then if it picked up a proton, it'd become positive. But this guy here, we learn on our table, this one here is an uh, acid, so it can donate a proton. Because I was polyprotic, because I have multiple H's to begin with, this HS minus can, again, get rid of the H plus and end up forming uh, S2 minus.
So therefore, when Hs minus goes this way, it's acting as a base. When Hs minus goes this way, it's acting as an acid. So I would expect something that's amphiprotic or amphoteric to have an H, so therefore I can still be an acid, but typically having a negative charge because I can pick up protons, pick up H pluses until I'm neutral. Uh, there's a couple exceptions for that here, especially in our organic section. We learned this Ku group, carboxylic uh, acid group here. This one here is acidic, so let's look at Chiku as an example. Uh, Chiku is your acetic acid again. Anytime we learned in our organic chapter we had this COOH functionality, we know right away how to draw it. C double bond O and an OH. This OH is actually the OH that would need to be a base. But in this case here, this OH is referred to as a hydroxyl group as opposed to hydroxide. Being covalently bonded, this hydroxide is stuck. When you drop acetic acid into water, it does not break up this bond here because I cannot release the OH, I'm not a base. In fact, what ends up happening is the chemical, uh, when you drop in a water, it manages to break up this bond no problem. If you look at the reason for that here, this is a weak acid, so again, equilibrium arrow. We get rid of that proton here. If you look at what's left over, you should be able to look at the structure and uh, say how come this one here might be able to exist. And in this case here, because by losing that proton here, I end up forming acetate. Uh, hopefully you're able to see in the Lewis picture here, well, it didn't have to be this top one double bonded. It could even be this bottom one double bonded. Because the double bond, remember, the double bond is not constantly flipping between forms. Neither of these Lewis structures is actually correct. But basically it's saying electrons are actually delocalized. They're actually spread around these two charges here. Resonance always adds stability. Organic reactions that generate something that has resonance uh, tend to be favorable, tend to be able to happen. Um, in organic, typically, it also uh, usually correlates with a faster reaction. But in general, just because I'm stable doesn't necessarily mean I'm faster. So in this case here, I end up forming acetate. So carboxyl as a group is, that's why we call it a carboxylic acid. It's acidic in solution, even though it looks like uh, it would be a base. And the other one here is an amine. An amine here, let's say I have an NH2 or even an NH3 in that case there. When I have an amine like NH2 minus, this one here uh, has a negative density here. This one here is able to pick up a proton. This is a strong base. We end up forming ammonia. Usually by the time things are neutral, we would expect that's it. I don't want to pick up any more protons. And yet because we have an amine group here, if you look at the Lewis structure for ammonia, Although it's a neutral molecule, it actually has a non-bonding pair. Ammonia does have the capacity to pick up yet another proton. It's going to be weak in the second uh, pickup there. We pick up that proton, and we actually end up with a molecule that's actually positively charged, and this is now the acid form. Uh, typically, when you're picking up protons, you would stop by the time you're neutral. But for an amine, because of this lone pair, this is actually getting into our third definition called a Lewis acid and a Lewis base. It actually doesn't really care whether there's H plus or not. We actually care about this electron donation. Because I have this electron pair donor, because I have H plus there, I can grab the H plus chemicals here that are able to donate an electron, which in grade 11 we call that a Lewis base. We're going to now call this one here now a Lewis. It's still a base, but it's in Lewis definition. Uh, Lewis base here is defined as an electron pair donor. It donates both of its electrons, whereas the H plus currently has no electrons. Uh, it would be uh, what's referred to as an electrophile. It's really hungry for electrons. This is now called the Lewis acid, and this one here is now the electron pair acceptor. So don't memorize acceptor is one thing, uh, donor is the other thing. It really depends on what you're accepting. If I'm donating H pluses, I'm an acid. If I'm donating electron pairs, uh, I'm a base. So that was our most broad definition here. As we get to this Lewis acid, Lewis base definition, we could totally have a reaction where, uh, for example, let's take this ammonia again. It may not have anything to do with H plus anymore, but the reaction is still sort of that coordinate bond as I've seen from before. So let's do boron trifluoride here. Because in this case here, ammonia uh, has that electron pair here, it's going to end up bonding. It's going to create an attachment with boron. Boron at first was an incomplete octet. Once these guys here bond together, they create a single bond. Because this one here was the donor, it's still referred to as the Lewis base. This one here is the Lewis acceptor, even though you don't see any H pluses uh, having been donated, having been picked up, there's no uh, H plus actually transferred. So that's why we say the Lewis definition is the most broad of it. Uh, we saw that a lot in our organic chapter with uh, different electrophilic and nucleophilic reactions. So continuing onwards here, I already used this terminology already. Acids and bases can be classified as either strong or weak. Careful, strong or weak is different from concentrate or dilute. 
Concentrate or dilute have to do with molarity, have to do with how much you manage to dissolve, whereas strong versus weak refer to dissociation. They refer to how well, chemically speaking, are the bonds really strong and I don't break up very well. If I'm strong, the bond actually breaks up fairly easily. So let's say HA, one-way arrow becomes H plus and A minus. Whereas if I'm weak, technically anything less than 100% would be weak. So with our table, we had our strong acids and we have our weak acids. Uh, strong acids would be ionizing 100%, they would be one-way arrows, uh, whereas weak acid could be even 99%, but when we actually look at it here, the weak ones we're talking about are on the order of about 10%, 3%, 5% or so. Even though technically we would be weak acids, technically these would all be equilibrium arrows here, we're going to find that there are relatively the stronger weak acids. They're going to have slightly um, larger Ka values, and we're going to slowly go down from there. So the strength actually measures for us how well this thing here ionizes. If it's strong, one-way arrow. If it's weak, uh, definitely an equilibrium arrow. Especially as we get to uh, doing our ice tables later on, uh, remember H plus can't exist in solution. So what we do uh, for the heading of the ice table is we actually write out the complex form. The complex form for an acid, basically I take the acid equation, the simplified, this one here would typically come from the equation. I pretend to add water on both sides. If I add water on both sides, I'm going to have HA in the presence of water. There I can see the conjugate uh, pairs a little bit better. Then I end up forming our hydronium and our A minus. If it's on the base side here, I'm going to have, I would read left, uh, right to left on the table here, A minus pick up a proton. That's actually all it's doing. It's picking up this uh, HA, but it's kind of like adding a hydroxide to both sides. And therefore, for the heading at least, I'm going to have my weak base in the presence of water it's going to end up creating this weak, so it's going to be a uh, double-headed arrow, uh, HA and the hydroxide, and then I have a, a base equation. Although both equations say the same thing, I'm able to track the hydroxide, especially on the ice table later on. Uh, the complex form is much more useful later on. Make sure you know this term here, the leveling effect. Basically, because I'm dropping everything in water, because all strong acids, strong just refers to it being 100% ionized, even though I might say, oh, HCl or HNO3, I might write it as if it's together because it's completely separated. HCl will 100% ionize to form H+. It's just H+, or even hydronium in solution. So therefore, all strong acids are hydronium. So all of them have been leveled by water. Similarly, for all strong bases, hydroxide is the strongest base that can exist in solution. That's the leveling effect here. Uh, this is only true when we're specifically talking about uh, in water. If I have a pure sample of sulfuric acid and a pure sample of nitric acid, we got that nitrating mixture in the organic chapter here. If I mix these two together, I can still have a relative difference which one here is better at donating protons uh, when we're not in water. But in our chapter here, we're mainly in water anyway, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, for H2SO4, be really careful. This is our only diprotic one. Most of our strong acids only had one H to give, 100%. Sulfuric acid is only strong in the first ionization. So yes, there's no chance for the conjugate base HSO4 minus to reform H2SO4, but HSO4 minus, if you look at its Ka value, this one here is actually just a weak acid, so equilibrium on the second transfer here, uh, which is why when you do uh, mole ratios with sulfuric acid, sometimes we're a little bit off in terms of acidity. The first proton came out 100%, uh, the second proton not as well. If we did it as a titration, we wouldn't have this problem because let's say I was titrating, I wanted to find the unknown amount of H2SO4. Let's say I slowly add NaOH. Well, the H2SO4 at first would 100% have broken off to form this H+. The hydroxide would slowly kill off the H+. It would have shifted this equilibrium over anyways. As I form some sulfuric acid, as a weak acid, this guy here doesn't ionize very well. I only get a little bit of H+, a little bit of sulfuric acid. But as I pull down this H+, it then shifts equilibrium over. A titration will purposely continue to pull this over until the HSO4- is completely gone anyways. So because of the Chatelier, uh, even though naturally the second protonation, the second, second release H+, doesn't happen all that well, by adding a base, I can slowly pull that over which is why for a titration curve, whether we're using a strong base or whether we're uh, reacting with a weak base as well, it should be the same volume that's needed to reach the equivalence because I am shifting that equilibrium all the way over. Uh, we learned that water, uh, not only is amphiprotic here, we had a very special equation for, here's our water equation, we call it uh, the self-ionization of water. You can also call it auto-ionization. It's water ionizing by itself. 
And in that case there, for this specific reaction, we learned that there's an equilibrium constant. So back in chapter 7, we were doing Kc. In this case here, we're just going to define as Kw. Uh, it's always written with water on the left-hand side, even with the full equation, 2 water and H2O+, plus, we learn that uh, we have Kw, which is uh, just going to be the multiplication of these two ion concentrations. So the way I think about it here is we know water is always in the background. Water will always have the ability to uh, ionize a little bit. Water will always regenerate a little bit of H+, plus, a little bit of hydroxide, um, to make sure both of them are not zero so that they can multiply. Turns out at 25 degrees, this Kw value is super tiny. If you did a neutral solution, a neutral solution means not that I can't have H plus or hydroxide, it just means I have equal numbers of acid and base. If these two were both x, we learn that both concentrations are on the order of 10 to the negative 7. So 0 0.001 molar. Really, really tiny. Uh, usually this uh, is far uh, tinier than if even if you had a strong acid or weak acid, but just be careful, even if I titrate, even if I completely cancel things here, uh, water will have the capacity to self-ionize. That's why we just do it by ratio. If the H plus ends up being any amount higher, usually if you have an acid, it's many orders of magnitude higher, we refer to that as acidic. On the pH scale, the pH scale is just the ruler. Uh, 7 is the dividing line at 25 degrees. So if we're explaining for how come pure water or neutral water uh, can have a pH of 8 or a pH of 10, they're probably not at this temperature. Your um, Kc or your Kw will change depending on what the temperature is. And again, we talked about here the terminology. When I say the pH decreases, that actually implies more acidic. The number is getting smaller. When the pH increases, we end up getting more basic. So pH is just a ruler, just like pOH is uh, the ruler as well. And in that case there, the farther away from the neutral 7 I get, uh, the more uh, acidic or basic that we're looking. Uh, we found that this was super handy, especially when numbers got to be super tiny. Uh, we put it on a log scale. So pH, by definition, hopefully you remember, the pH is defined as the negative log of H+, plus, while the pOH is the negative log of hydroxide. Pretty much if you have P anything, it's just talking about here, negative log of that thing. I am watching for the H+. plus. This is still just a ruler, though. If my H+, plus is fairly high, because of the negative, that's going to drop my pH. If I'm watching the hydroxide, the hydroxide could very well be low. If I have a negative of a smaller number here, my pOH here would be relatively high. In both cases there, that would mean acidic. For neutral water, or for, they call it pure water, uh, H plus is equal to uh, OH minus. If we have happened to add an acid or add a base, we can then use this uh, table here. This first connection is basically through Kw. Kw is H plus times hydroxide. The logarithmic form of that one there is pKw, is H plus plus OH minus, uh, um, sorry, pH plus pOH. So basically, because we are using logarithms to get down here, we aren't really surprised that a multiplier end up becoming a plus. That happens with your log rules. Uh, going downwards, you use the negative log to inverse it here. Uh, in words, you can say it's anti-log. We're going to go anti-log. Actually, that's wrong on this side here. Uh, anti-log of, careful, there's a negative pH or negative pOH. Uh, anti-log on your calculators are sometimes written 10 to the power of. I'm basically undoing that uh, logarithm base 10. So pretty much this uh, table here summarizes, if you have one of them, you can navigate your way around this diagram however you like for the one that you're looking for. All four readings wouldn't change the fact if I'm looking at H plus and I'm asking you for hydroxide, if it was an acid to begin with, I'm still going to get uh, a very small amount of hydroxide because it still has to be acid. Just converting the way I'm showing the number doesn't suddenly change what the chemical actually is. Uh, we talked about strong and weak, depending uh, on sort of where it lands on the pH here. Strong things with our typical molarities, strong will typically knock us into the 0 to 2 to 3s. Weak things don't ionize as well, so weak. And then similarly for bases, weak and strong. That's just a generalization. You could actually up the molarity enough that it actually knocks it pretty far uh, down the table. They really like asking this question, what's an experimental way that you can differentiate strong versus weak? So, so far what we've said here, uh, we know, if I know the chemical, strong means 100%, weak means less than 100% ionized. Some things chemically you can talk about here. Because a strong thing ionizes 100%, we're going to get a lot of ions. This one here will be more conductive. Remember, for conductivity, we need more ions. 
if I don't happen to ionize very well, the bulk of it actually stays as my molecule here. It doesn't really break off very well, less conductivity. The rate of reaction will also be different. This one will generate more chemical. So more chemical will mean more reactant particles because the rate depends on your starting concentrations. Uh, your rates will be faster. Let's say we're uh, like a neutralization uh, sort of deal here. And then in terms of uh, pH, like we said here, because we ionize more, we're going to expect to have more H+, given they're going to usually say this word here, equimolar solutions. Equimolar just means equal molarity. If I had one molar HCl or one molar Chiku, uh, that's fair in terms of concentration standpoint. Um, it's going to be pH much lower for the uh, strong one than the weak one. Right? Uh, in a similar way, we did Kw as the uh, equilibrium constant here. For every given acid, we can actually define the equilibrium constant as well. If in this case here we had acetic acid, this one here is a weak acid, my equilibrium constant, I'm going to call that Ka. So Ka is a number that's uh, it's intensive, it's specific uh, for the chemical itself. It basically is a product of a reactant. It's H plus, in this case here, multiply acetate all over acetic acid, although I would have had uh, the plus water because water is a pure liquid. It doesn't uh, count in this uh, equation here. Uh, that's what the Ka is. You're given a, in your IB data booklet, you're given the Ka's, but because these numbers tend to be fairly small, you usually aren't given just a Ka by itself, you're given it as pKa, and pKa is actually the negative log of this expression here. Uh, again, because of that negative here, the lower or the smaller the pKa, that means the bigger the Ka, uh, that means the stronger the acid is actually going to be. You can do a similar fashion with KB, and then you can do all that uh, nice ice table stuff. Uh, on that note there, let me just uh, show you an example of an uh, ice table. Uh, let's do it for uh, base again. So ammonia and H+, this is the simplified equation. This just says, as a bronze to lower base is supposed to pick up proton, we just talked about adding hydroxide to both sides here. That way I can get the complex equation. That way I can get the more thorough version. I can actually track hydroxide. I would have my ice table. Usually the initial line will just be the starting acid or the starting base before ionized. Uh, maybe I start off with, let's say, one molar, this one here. Uh, if I don't mention how much is ionized yet, you can assume that these are zero. We can do a minus x plus x plus x because I can't drop any lower than zero. I just crunch through the math there, one minus x here. And then basically in uh, both Chem 12 and IB 12, we never need to use a quadratic formula. Uh, basically, you're going to need to write down the assumption here. Because this one here, we know it to be a weak base, because the constant is so tiny, uh, x is insignificant based on 1. So we're going to actually have to write down here, when 1 minus off the smidgen and the fraction that actually uh, goes over, this is basically going to be 1. Yes, in some sense, we're sort of saying x is insignificant, but we're actually going through all this work to actually find out how small x actually is. It's just that relative to the 1, it's ins insignificant. Uh, whenever we have this equilibrium line here, we can punch it into the KEQ expression here. In this case here, it would be KB. So KB is equal to, um, in this case here, ammonium, hydroxide, all over ammonia. And therefore, we have an X, an X. This one would have been 1 minus X, but because I have done the assumption, I can drop that. You have to include this statement, or it just looks like I was sloppy with the math here. You can solve your way through. I can find KB. Uh, from pKb on the table, I'll need an anti-log negative uh, Kb to get to Kb. And then once I find the x, do yourself a favor and go back. They usually ask you more than just, oh, what's the hydroxide equilibrium? They might ask you, what's the pH? You can use that box again to navigate yourself around. Right. All right, so a few last things here and we, as we talk about titrations in general. Um, so hydrolysis, uh, when you do a titration, when you react an acid in a base, we say we produce a salt and water at the equivalence point, equivalence point is I've just added enough acid to perfectly kill off the base. I would expect a titration that has at equivalence point. So equivalence is sort of the stoichiometric point. Careful, it's different from endpoint. The stoichiometric point here is when acid has perfectly balanced the mole ratios. If it's one to one, they just cancel. If it's two to one, I have twice as much acid and so forth. I s would expect this one here to be neutral and yet sometimes Depending on that neutral ionic compound here, sometimes this guy here can hydrolyze. To test whether this salt here hydrolyzes, we do a couple things very systematically. We break up the salt. We get rid of chemicals that I know won't bond. 
and then we end up looking on the table to figure out whether it's an acid or base. So for example, let's say I have uh, NH4, NO3. Let's say that was the salt that was created from the titration. I would have expected here this one here would be completely neutral, and yet when I dissociate this, this is be going to become NH4 plus and NO3 minus. Your spectators are going to be group 1 or group 2. Those are typically soluble. That's why they're spectators. For your conjugate uh, anions here, they're going to be the top five. It's just going to be this listing here. If I'm not one of those five, I might actually be able to uh, react. In this case here, this is that conjugate. If it is a spectator, you can drop it out. If it's not a spectator, check on the table. Oh, this guy's on the acid side. Because this is an acid, this guy here will end up regenerating some H+. Yes, it actually does create the conjugate base form. But remember, just sort of in terms of amounts here, I had a lot of the ammonium created from the salt. Only a little bit forms the base. Even this equal amount forms the acid here. If this base here were to regenerate hydroxide, I would have even lesser amount. So that's not really going to create a lot of hydroxide. Water will even self-ionize for more than the, uh, hydroxide. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, because this thing here ended up forming an H+, we know this one here is acidic. We talked about Ka and Kb. Uh, Ka, is especially if it's an acid, or Kb as a base. Uh, and depending on the size of those numbers, we have the different measures of strengths, uh, measures of how much it ionizes. Essentially, we had said, the bigger these ones here, the better they are doing their job, so better ionization. But because pKa and pKb do the opposite, we actually want a smaller. These are still going to be positive numbers. We want a smaller pKa for a stronger acid or a smaller pKb for a stronger base. So a number that's less than um, like 7, 6, 5, 4. The lower the number, the better it is as acid or base. Uh, titration, we've done a lot. Uh, it's basically a stoichiometry problem. We basically want the indicator to change color to tell me when to stop. I want to basically test. I have some unknown amount. Uh, let's say it's an unknown acid again. That way I can drop the base. Uh, although I have unknown molarity, this guy here, usually we pipette either 10 mils or we pipette 25 mils. That's what our pipettes are engineered to uh, deliver. I have my barrette. I fill it something more than half. I have my base in the barrette. And essentially the idea here is I'm hoping that the base will be added slow enough so if it ends up finding H+, it'll cancel out the H+. So drop in a little bit of base here, cancels out, the color remains. You drop in a little hydroxide, cancels out. I'm looking for that one point where I drop in an extra drop of hydroxide, but it really can't find any H+. At that point here, we've hit the equivalence point. So it's when you've perfectly added the amounts to perfectly match up with the stoichiometry. Uh, and basically, that's when you stop. There's no limiting excess, and you can do some more ratio sort of calculations. We would get the volume reading from the barrette. We knew the initial volume. Yes, in some sense, as I dropped in the base, the final volume would be different. But remember, I'm not actually ever measuring the final volume in the Erlenmeyer. I know the hydroxide is just used to count the H+. The H+, was originally only sitting in the 10, which is why you can even squirt down extra water from the side here. You can totally dilute it down, wash down the sides. doesn't really matter because I know once you count the H+, I'm going to end up dividing by 10 uh, for the initial concentration. There's a couple other neat tricks you can do for titrations. You can uh, figure out, especially for something like sulfuric acid, It uh, we had talked about this one here, protonating strong the first one, and the second one was weaker. We can actually figure out, based on how much hydroxide I end up adding, how far this equilibrium was pushed over. Have I added roughly the amount of H+, plus, just half what I need for equivalence, so therefore I would expect I just removed one proton, or if I remove uh, twice, uh, I put in two parts hydroxide, maybe I killed off all the H+, plus, I shifted the equilibrium completely over, and now it's actually ionized completely. I can do that in terms of partial neutralization. Because titrations have this advantage of being able to figure out for you, uh, counting how much H+, plus and hydroxide in the solution, you can actually use this to find molar mass, uh, especially when I'm titrating, even though I have my stock container over here, I'm going to pour out a uh, aliquot of it, a small fraction of it. I destroy the sample here. I find the concentration of my sample. Concentration is intensive, so I know whatever this molarity is found to be is actually the molarity of my entire stock bottle, uh, and I can do uh, mol molar mass or determination questions from there, similarly with percent purity. Uh, unfortunately, when we do the titration here, your H plus and the hydroxide, uh, they're both colorless, so I wouldn't know when to stop. So what I need to do is I actually need to add in a third chemical here. This is just a cheat that basically just changes color. Uh, so it tells me whether I'm relatively acid or relatively basic. 
the indicators are typically going to be weak, so they have to be able to shift both ways. They have to be able to color change color 1 to 2 and back and forth. Uh, we're going to have, I usually call it H in. Uh, it's going to be a weak acid, so equilibrium. We get H plus and we get an in minus. The H in can be just color number 1. For phenethylene, the acid color was uh, colorless, whereas the basic color was a pink color. Careful, every indicator, because it is a chemical, every indicator will have its own Ka expression. We did a derivation in class here. Uh, basically, at the end point, at this perfect color change point here, the H in and the in minus form actually perfectly cancel out. So if I try to do the Ka expression for my indicator, only at the equivalence point, because the acid form and the base form are completely canceled out, we'll get that intermediate care intermediate color, Ka actually matches up with H+, plus, so therefore pKa is actually matched up with uh, pH. So if ever you want to find the Ka of the indicator, find the pH when it actually changes color. Every indicator will have its own color change point. Hopefully I'm choosing one that color changes close to the equivalence point, uh, but every indicator has that relationship here. The pH is equivalent to the pKa. We can plot this on what's called the titration curve, so let's do that. Uh, we did an acetic acid and a strong base titration curve. Uh, we have, this is our pH. I'm sampling the pH as I slowly drop in volume of base. The volume of base added here. This shooting up point here is going from that last drop of acid to what would be our equivalence point, and then to just one extra drop of base. Suddenly I'm in the basic region. Uh, if I'm a strong acid, strong base titration, the equivalence point is exactly 7. For a strong acid, strong base, this is not the case because I actually have a buffer region. In this case here, because this is a weak acid, strong base titration curve here, we're going to find that the conjugate, the salt that we end up producing, ends up acting as a weak acid, um, sorry, acting as a weak base here. And in that case there, the equivalence point is actually slightly higher than 7. So pH bigger than 7 for a weak acid, strong base curve. And therefore, for my indicator, I want to choose an indicator. If I know roughly where the color change is supposed to be, if I know it's supposed to be 7 for that first mixture here, maybe choose phenethylene. Uh, pH 8 to 10 is when it changes. I don't want to choose an indicator. I can do the color change no problem, but if the color change doesn't tell me something about the shooting up region, it doesn't really help. Uh, especially for paper 3, when you have your database question, they might give you a sample of a titration curve. You'll have to basically read the VB. V half is exactly going to be half of whatever VB is. There's a special point here right in the middle of that buffer region. Uh, remember a buffer, you can add good amounts of base and good amounts of acid, and the pH, although it does change, it doesn't change very drastically. So in this case here, we create a natural buffer. We can actually make a buffer ourselves by beefing up. I can have the weak thing that I had, and I'm going to beef up the for a weak acid. I'm going to beef up the conjugate base form. I'm going to purposely add conjugate base on the outside. Or if I have the weak uh, base form, I can beef up the conjugate acid. So uh, definition for a buffer here, I need to have appreciable amounts of both. So if I have a weak acid, uh, let's just do HA here. Equilibrium with H plus and A minus. At first, if I have something that's weak, most of it doesn't ionize very well. I'm sort of half a buffer. If you end up pulling the H plus down, I can shift to the right because I have a lot of H plus. But currently, if you add H plus, I can't shift to the left. I'm going to run an A minus. Let's artificially come along and add a salt that contains A minus. That's because I don't have a bottle of just pure negative charge. But if I have, let's say, an alkali salt guaranteed to be soluble, I beef up the A minus. Yes, it's actually going to shift the equilibrium already. But once I beef up the A minus, because I have good amounts of both and because we are in equilibrium, we're a weak um, acid or base, we can actually shift either way. I can, to a small extent, resist a large change in pH. Diluting a buffer has no effect on the pH because it's going to dilute both this one and dilute this one at the same amount. Uh, it's just going to mean that the buffer is going to run out a lot quicker. We're not going to have as much room to buffer. Um, you don't need to go too much farther on the base side or acid side, and the pH has already jumped really drastically. Uh, we saw the henderson hasselbach equation here. I wouldn't bother memorizing it, so henderson hasselbach It typically has this expression, especially for a buffer. I want another way of being able to find the H+. Plus. Typically, it's going to be so tiny. Because for a buffer, both the A- and the HA are going to be appreciable amounts, we basically played around with this a little bit. Uh, we had derived the expression. I took the negative log of both sides, negative log of H+, plus, A-, minus HA. We know that when I take logarithms, it's just a plus. So negative log of H+, plus, 
uh, it's going to be plus a negative log of a minus over h a. I think the henderson hasselbalch equation is actually in your uh, data booklet as well. This is going to be pKa is equal to the pH. Uh, if you like uh, doing a plus, I can flip the logarithm here. I can go, oh, that's going to be HA over A minus. This is just another way. If you happen to know the pKa of the chemical, this depends on the buffer itself. So this depends on uh, the exact weak acid, exact weak base. And if you know the ratio between the two conjugate forms, I can use that to find the pH and therefore find the H plus. So that there is a buffer here. Uh, one other note here on a titration, uh, just before we move on. Uh, for a titration, because our goal is to find some unknown concentration, one of the molarities you have to know uh, very well. The question is, how did I know this molarity very well? You could have back titrated it. You could have done another titration to find this, but you get to end this problem of how do I eventually start off with a chemical that I know the concentration really well. They use this term here called primary standard. I think of primary standard here as a solid. And because it's a solid, there's only a handful of chemicals that do this. Um, so the conjugate uh, a base that's a primary standard, or KHP, which we use in our lab here, these, chemically speaking, are so inert, they don't absorb water, they don't absorb carbon dioxide, things in the air. So therefore, when you weigh out, let's say I have one gram of this, let's say I pre-dissolve it inside a beaker, I transfer it to the volumetric, remember that's the correct way of um, uh, making a solution here. By the time I hit whatever this volume here, I know the exact concentration really well because I can believe this one gram is actually one gram. Sodium hydroxide, in comparison, doesn't act very well as a primary standard. Sodium hydroxide, you can weigh out one gram, no problem, but while it's been sitting there, it's been absorbing water, moisture in the air, and basically the, this one gram here has a bunch of impurities. Although I'm going through the calculation thinking it's one gram, it may not actually, in reality, be actually one, uh, one gram. Uh, we talked about uh, back to buffers here. There's some buffers in our blood to try to maintain the pH. Our optimum pH range is a pH slightly basic, so 7.3. If it goes any beyond 7.2 and 7.5, it could be deadly. So we have some natural buffers here, uh, lots of buffers that constantly replenish themselves. So when you eat foods that are really acidic or you encounter bases, it doesn't change your um, uh, pH of the blood uh, too much. One main thing uh, why we need the pH very constant is hemoglobin is our oxygen carrier. If we're overly acidic or overly basic, either the oxygen has a hard time binding to hemoglobin or the oxygen binds too well to hemoglobin. When it reaches your muscles, it doesn't release uh, properly. Uh, last little bit here is just a sort of environmental impact. Uh, we knew from our chapter three, uh, metal oxides typically are basic in solution. That's because they're ionic. Non-metal oxides typically are acidic. Rain is naturally acidic because of CO2. CO2 upon reacting with water forms carbonic acid, which will very quickly uh, end up ionizing to become H plus and HCO3 minus and even further to H2CO3 minus. So it's a non-metal uh, it's a non-metal oxide. We would have expected it to form extra H pluses. Uh, the, when we start calling it acid rain is when it drops even lower than pH 5.6. Acid rain is typically uh, like pH 2, pH 3 or so. It's because of industrial things that we're tossing into the air. We're tossing in SOX and NOx. Any combination of SO2s and NO3s, also non-metal oxides, also generate water. Uh, sorry, also generate uh, acids when they touch water. So make sure you look over that very last section. Uh, what are some uh, environmental things I can do to try to get rid of this? A uh, couple sources here. I can limit the amount of these gases that I toss into the air. If it's not in the air, it's not going to form these acids here. I can find ways to actually neutralize some of the H2SO4s and the acids that get generated. Or better yet here, I can run, for example, this is called flue gas desulfurization. Uh, desulfur. And basically, you can look at the reactions again. We're going to react calcium oxide. I'm going to try to sequester or capture some of this SO2, capture it into the solid form, and don't let this SO2 uh, just randomly escape into the atmosphere. So there are some methods that are good for pre-combustion -method, pre methods and post-combustion methods. Uh, so make sure you look over that last section. Right. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, take care, guys.